Come on. Well, yes, I'm back from Hawaii and what a difference it is here. In the two weeks I've been away, it was actually just over two weeks, and it was an amazing trip as you can see. In the two weeks I've been away, it has rained, I think, uh, more than did the entire spring and summer we've just had. We've had about 250 mil of rain in about six days. Uh, everywhere was flooded. I could not have picked a better time to go away. But I've come back now, and boy, is there still work to do. I've just come back and all my feeders have got to come off from my nukes and my mini plus hives, which is an awful lot. So that's what I'm starting to do now. We're going in, taking off feeders. I'm going to find the old colony that's died out. I'm going to find feeders that have still got syrup in, but the syrup can be reused. We'll just tip it into one big container and we'll use it next year. That's no big deal. What we're going to have to do is um, be very careful in what we do because there is, unfortunately this year, seems to be uh, a lot of colonies that aren't as heavy as we'd like them to be for the winter. I had a quick chat to my colleague uh, the other day and it transpired that he feels exactly the same, that when, when I left I was thinking they was still a little bit light. But the problem is we've had no extra bonus weather that we usually get this time of year. It's gone straight from uh, like really, really, really warm and, and dry to to freezing cold and wet very quickly. So the ivy that we had that we were hoping would give a couple more weeks hasn't materialized. It, all the pollen was washed off the ivy last week in the rain and what's left is coming in, but it's very, very small amounts now. That in this, that overall, that, that sum of, um, that, that overall absolute uh, bonus that we get for, for a week, maybe 10 days, hasn't materialized. So the ivy is finished. We're now looking at um, the reality of uh, giving some candy and I do believe as I said before feeding early if you're going to have to give candy make, make that decision give it to the colonies early and then they mix it with what they've got and take it down into that colony while they're still a little bit active if you give a very tiny colony a big slab of candy in January February when it's hardly moving it's as good as dead as far as I'm concerned because a lot of the heat goes into that slab of candy it's better to get it down into the colony while you can and uh, bite the bullet early as possible because you just they just don't recover but we don't want small colonies anyway i'm hoping that most of mine are good um, and uh, i'm going to go and start work on those now that stinks so this is how completely disorganized i am i was hoping just to come down here to the bottom of the garden at home to do 20 minutes work and didn't need another hive tool but what i have done is also got some of these polystyrene eggs out for our mini plus as I said before, I'm going to do a video on the Mini Plus to cover all aspects of why I use them and why they're good for me. But that's to come in a few weeks. Um, what I do is I get uh, this 30 centimeter, sorry, 30 millimeter polystyrene, cut it to 30 by 30 centimeter, cut the middle out, and that's a perfect eat. And you can put your feed into the um, top of the uh, um, hive, the Mini, mini Plus hive. That sits down around it, then there's a hole in the middle where the bees can come out and feed. And you can use this for feeding pollen sub in the spring. So basically this will stay on now all the time. So it's a great piece of kit. The, um, the main thing I have to do is feed. If I find a colony that is light, I'm going to give straight away give some candy. Now we're, I'm using Apifonda. It's probably one of the most expensive you can buy. It's because I had some from last year that I didn't use. 
Okay, so I cut this into, into slabs. This one has been opened, so I covered it in a bag. But when it's sealed, it's better. But uh, you can just cut lumps off in pieces and stick it on top. As I said, it is one of the most expensive, but it is good because it's ready mixed. One of the ones I want to try is the sugar boards, but I don't believe in really giving candy or sugar boards or anything at all. My whole um, ethos is colony should be fed up enough before the end of the year, but this proves that isn't possible all the time. And what's happened is we uh, are not prepared. So what I said before, I'm hoping that the majority are, but I know there's a few that aren't. So I'm just gonna have to do my best to feed them now and get them give them this before the winter really sets in. In terms of temperatures, we've gone from an average of about 12 to 18 degrees centigrade in the day to now uh, nines and tens all day, uh, and with a lot of rain and wind. So, but the base of the bees have not been foraging. So that's why I need to get this done now. I've had my holiday, I've got to get my finger out. I'm still recovering from jet lag, which is an absolute killer. I left Hawaii on the, um, uh, on the Friday night last week, Friday night about eight o'clock. I had a six hour flight then from Kona to uh, Seattle. In Seattle, unfortunately, I had an eight hour layover. Uh, then I got on the plane from Seattle to Charles de Gaulle and flew through the night, 10 and a quarter hours, arrived in um, at Paris Charles de Gaulle the following uh, morning. But it shows you, you lose two days and you lose 12, 12 to 13 hours on the time clock. And it's an absolute killer. But it was definitely worth it, don't get me wrong, but it was, it takes you four days, five days to actually get over the jet lag. Anyway, if I go to sleep while I'm doing this, you understand why now. <laughs> but here we go. Let's get some of this done. So like I've got a little bit of sunshine. Feeders are empty, that's a good sign. So these are coming off. Have a little look in each colony. We've got honey in this, we've got bees milling around. But I want to give every colony an eek for the spring, and I don't want to have to do it later on. And I also want to take out my pieces of fiberboard that hold down the frames, that hold down the plastic, sorry. So I'm take out a couple of these so you can see. These are on the honey. And the reason why I'm doing this is I want to have a very quick look underneath. See how many, oh, there's thousands of bees underneath, that's beautiful. I'm still going to give them that eek ready. So on goes the plastic, but I'm going to close off the hole for now, unroll that. Back on goes the poly, sorry, the aluminium. That's closed, and I'm going to put an eek on. So I'm not going to give this anything just yet because I'm pretty happy with it. So there's one of my eeks. It's just to show you what I'm going to do to each one. So that's now pushed down. It's now sealed. I have insulation on the inside of these boxes, on these lids. I don't know if you've seen that before. We make these lids and the inside we put insulation so the top is insulated and it's rainproof. So any rain we have that falls, we leave the sides of these not, not um, stapled down. So basically the rain can drip away a little bit and it leaves a, an air gap there for the, um, for the hives to ventilate a little bit. So it keeps the wood lasting for longer. There's nothing worse than seeing I used to do all this when I used to make my own nukes, and you can see in my previous videos, I stapled everything like this, boom, 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 all around. But I've learned that all that does is trap moisture behind, so you just leave it open. It's quicker to do where you put four screws on when we bend this metal over, printer's pad, printer's metal, and then you have a nice roof. Yes, these are expensive to make in terms of the initial cost, because you're making a proper little lid, and you could buy the, the ones that come with them, and I will go through this again when I do the video on the Mini Plus. But once you've got this set up, this will last you 20 years, longer than the other poly roofs would do. And this is stronger, it's more robust, and, you, and it also is more, better insulated. So these go back on, like that. Done, finished. You can see that, but that's all pure honey and the bees are on the top of it. And they'll cluster on that now. But I'm not gonna dig down into the brood nest. There's just no need. And that's absolutely lovely. It's what I wanna see in every colony. There's some good weight to this one. 
thing. We're going to work him down the lines of the other hives over here after. All those, they've all got to be done. And then after that, we've got all the nukes to look at. There's a load in the other side. So it's going to be busy. But I'll do a bit of time lapse so it speeds things up a bit. Back on goes the plastic, back on goes the aluminium, on this way, back on goes an eek, and I've got some candy here, this goes straight over the hole like this, it's a bit sticky, I know there's a long winter coming and I want them to have plenty right now, it's only November, it's done, come back in a few days and you'll see that they'll already start eating that pretty quick and they'll start taking it down and filling up any of that nest they need to. Classically next door, this was one that became a drone layer early on in the, in the um, later on in the year. So I just let the drones hang around until they died off. This will be melted down. You can see the pollen in there. That's a classic sign of a colony that isn't using its pollen up. They stock it. <laughs> Where I've just been to Hawaii, that would have been full of small high beetle by now. These will get, these will, this will keep for next year, that's a good frame there. Back to the workshop with that. Just go working through, cleaning up, sorting stuff out. The end of the year, there's always loads of it to do. Just wanted to show you this one, I haven't ripped the top off yet, the, the plastic, just to show you uh, what I'm after. This is kind of a beautiful one, nice bees too, but this is what I really want to see. I really want to see this. Five frames, six frames at the top, completely full of honey. Not many bees up here, okay? But if I lift off the top, the underneath will be packed. And that's what happens is this time of year, most of the bees are actually, this time of year, they're actually still around a bit of a brood cluster down the bottom, down the bottom here. And if I was to lift this top off, you'd see most of the bees are down the bottom. As they finish their brood, they come up and they hang around the honey more because that's where obviously they need it. They have honey in the bottom frames for the moment, but as the winter continues, they'll be coming up to, and just clustering here. And that's why it's so important for me to have two boxes here. Because otherwise, what happens is a lot of the bees are in the bottom, only box if there's one box, and they use all the honey around the brood. Suddenly, there's nothing, and they've got nowhere to, nowhere to find extra honey. Having this extra storage gives the clear advantage for the bees. So you've got to get honey in to this colony before it's too late, before the end of the season, because now it's too late. If there's no honey in the top, and they've just got one level, which I've got about three here that are one level, there's one there. But they're okay, because I'm gonna give them candy in a minute, because they've got an eek on. But you have to get honey in your, or nectar, I should say, and, and sugars into your colonies before it's too late, because otherwise you just don't do it. You cannot be one of these people who keep splitting and splitting and splitting. It doesn't work. You have to live in reality and you have to do the right thing for your bees and prepare for the winter. As soon as you get into July and the dearth starts, you start preparing for winter. You get your last queens made and you start feeding if they're not feeding themselves. If you've got a flow coming on, don't rely on it unless you can guarantee that flow is gonna give you plenty of food. It's just not up to it. So this one, I've got nothing to do. The bees are lovely. There's five frames, six, six frames, sorry, of honey, and the bees are underneath. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'm just gonna grab... Right, so all the feeders are off now. I've got to collect them all up, bring them back here. It's so much toing and frying in this job, but I've got the truck as close as I can get to uh, where it's gonna go. What I do is I actually um, do it a certain way so that when I get back to the workshop, it's fairly easy for me to sort out. So all the lids go into this bin here, and all the... Uh, all, the, all the feeders that are open, I leave, I leave the tops in, 
okay, um, then I fill them with a little bit of water and they slosh around on the way to the workshop and when I get there I tip the water out, we take them apart and I soak them in, a, in um, soda crystals. Okay, and soda crystals are great because they're actually, they help dissolve any, uh, anything untoward. In other words, they help, to help dissolve any wax. They do have action of sterilizing the, the inside of the, the feeder. But I'll tell you where I stand on that. I have the attitude with most things here that you could spend weeks and weeks and months and months and all your life cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. And fundamentally, it won't make a lot of difference to how your bees are. What you need to do is be observing your colonies. Because if you find something sinister, you deal with it at the colony level, not at the, at the feeder level or at the, at the hive level or, or, or at the, or the, 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 the cover board or the plastic level. What I'm trying to say is you, you need to find the disease before it gets into the feeder. Okay, so all I'm doing is we're rinsing off. The main thing is to get the stickiness out. We get the stickiness out. We go for a process. We generally, everything is cleaned, scraped. The loose, um, uh, the loose stuff is taken off. We, what we do find with these feeders is we often get a little bit of, um, this is the reality of the inside of a feeder. They often build a little bit of cane. We, we try to scrape that out. Most of this time it's brittle. We'll soak these in a big basin of water and we'll scrape off this. But, and this, this part, the inner cup goes into a bin and we'll scrape that out, but you'll never get it all off. Um, the, one of the ways of cleaning out a feeder is when you put it back on the colony, you take off this inner cup, okay? Then the bees can come out. But if you don't remember to put it back in, when the ivy starts, what happens is they sometimes build comb in here. So it's like six to one half a dozen to another. The biggest thing we have to do is just scrape out this part in here, okay? and then just give it a wash and a rinse and some soda crystal solution on that and that's done for the year. Then we put them in boxes and they're, they're done for next year. I can't really do any more. When you're in a commercial business or something, you have to be, rea reality has to kick in. When, when you have 150, 200 feeders, which I have got this year to clean out, um, I think it's going to be more like 200. Uh, I could be there all winter. So you've got to be rapid, you've got to be quick and you just got to get on with it. But it takes a lot of time and that's the problem with beekeeping. There's so much processes of, um, I think Ian Steffler coined it, where beekeeping is basically putting down boxes and picking them up again and moving stuff around and, and in a timely fashion, sometimes with bees, sometimes without. So you're constantly doing that. And I'm still doing it now and it's November, but I know that in another two weeks time, everything will be finished. Everything will be put away. Everything will be cleaned, that is cleaned to the level we need to clean it to. And I found no disease touch wood so far. Um, I found nothing that I'm sinister. I'm sometimes looking at colonies if they're not very strong. You know, how far do you go with, with this disease issue? You, you, you've just got to use common sense. And I think if you generally don't leave material lying around that's dirty and then it's unclean, and generally if you have bees that you're breeding from good known hygienic stock, and generally if you uh, keep your bees well fed and don't allow them to suffer in dearth and things like that, you're gonna go a long way to, oh sorry, the major thing is, and generally keep your varroa populations down, you're generally, with those things there, you're gonna keep on top of your disease problems because diseases come through, through bad, uh, bad husbandry and varroa. Varroa is still the number one problem that causes diseases in your colony, period, end of. And if you work on those, you don't have to be so ridiculously maniac with cleaning like I see some, be some beekeepers doing. You know, I see all this stuff on forums about people scorching boxes and cleaning this and cleaning that. For me, if a colony dies and it's in the apiary, but the hive is generally still fairly clean, if it's died because it was queenless, if it's died because the queen became drone layer, what's the point in humping it all back to the workshop and scraping it out and burning it? It makes no difference at all as far as I'm concerned. Yes, management-wise, it's a good thing to do. Overall, keep cleaning if you have the time to do it, but it's not necessary in the real world. You just get on with it and you reuse that colony. A good, strong colony with a prolific queen cleans that colony out straight away. You see all the bits underneath. They can do it. They know what they're doing. And why should we, why should we breed bees that we're, ha we're having to put in boxes that we're constantly having to clean? Our bees should be able to cope with they move into trees in the wild. They deal with dirty areas. They clean it all up. We shouldn't be so paranoid about things. It's just the way I feel. That's my point of view. Getting back to the job in hand. Got to collect all this up now. Get it back to the workshop tomorrow, rinsing out, and then they'll all be stacked and dried. When they're dried, they'll go away. And then in another four months time, we get it all out again and start again.
back up to the workshop where all the feeders come to be cleaned. Just to very briefly show you what we do and how we get them clean. We never get them really clean. Um, it's a kind of compromise because the bees build them far more than you can ever clean off. But what we do is basically we stack them up like this and then we move them from the piles when, when we've got room into the sink to soak. Now we soak them in a soda crystal, which is a French brand, but it's basically um, this one called Saint Marc. It's, it's soda crystals. Um, don't know if I can really tell you much more than that, really. But it's a really mild one, but it's really good for cleaning and it dissolves propolis, it dissolves wax. Um, so basically we tip a, a good cupful in each sink full and that does sterilize it a bit. So from there, we have a couple of things. We have a tool here that is useful for everything. When these feeders come in, they come in with the plastic lid on. So we basically clean around here, the four sides. And that's the most important thing of the whole thing, because if you don't get the cap ready to go back on properly next year, if it doesn't fit on properly, just a slightly bigger gap under here, I'll show you. If you get too big a gap here, when you put that nut back on next spring when it's clean, because either there's some shit inside of it, or it's, um, it's not cleaned properly. If it doesn't close down properly, the bees will get out and then they'll start building in here. So the most important thing for us is to clean the inside of here to get rid of the wax and to also clean that bit with this tool. Okay, it's just a broken knife that is actually flat and it's really good for just getting out those corner pieces. And that's what we find is one of the most difficult things to get out. But when you clean that out, then we give it a quick rub over with the thing and also clean this side. This is important too, because if that's not flat, when you come to put that on the top of your hive next year, um, you need that clean, okay? But the action of soaking all this in the crystals does get rid of most of the stuff. And afterwards, we uh, give them a rinse. These feeders have a rinse, and then we go and stack them outside. So we stack them all outside here. I give them a turn once, like that, and any water that's inside the inner part then comes out. A few days later, they're all dry. They're just stacked on top of an old syrup container. So anywhere we can find them, on top of a barrel, whatever you can do. And then we put them in these. And in these, we made up these simple um, bins that hold 32, 33 in each one. So here's a couple here. Something really simple. When we need them for next year, they're ready. And you can stack three up high. It's just a way of storing your feeders. So we've got the, uh, the cups in the middle. But next year, when you need them, you grab them and you go. But they're stored like that, they're kept away, there's no mice gets in there, not that it would be any problem. And that's what we do. That's the feeders put away for you, but it's all part of the process. It's all part of how we clean up at the end of the year, and it's a lot of work. This is just another classic example of where you profit from your hard work in the winter. It might not seem a lot of things, it might, it might not seem a lot of work, it might seem completely obvious, but if you don't spend time cleaning your feeders and getting them ready and putting it in them and putting them in a box where you can get to them ready for the following spring when you need them in a hurry, when you have no time, you're putting clean feeders back onto colonies. You haven't got to think about it. It's all done. It's what we call winter winter beekeeping, and this is what it's all about. It's the it's the like they say, the attention is in the detail. And this is part of the detail. This is what beekeeping is all about. You can forget, you know, sw swaggering around with barrels of honey and selling nukes and all that. This, is as this preparation is as important as other things in beekeeping. It's all about attention to detail and getting everything ready. So when you get there in the spring, and suddenly the spring is early like this year, like it caught me completely unawares, you've got frames, you've got feeders, you've got clean hives, you've got everything ready you need to save you time, to give you a clean start to the year, you're not stressed, you've got a long seven months ahead of you working your backside off trying to get everything done. If your prep isn't done, you're up shit creek with a broken paddle right from the start, and that's what you do not want to do. It's all about putting that time in. Be warned, get your winter prep done properly. That's all I've got time for now anyway. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.